So what do you think would happen if one day you woke up and all the signage in the world was gone? No signs anywhere. Now, there's probably a part of us that would be excited that all the advertising was gone. Well, I'm sure we wouldn't miss that. But when we hit the roads and the highways, there probably would be chaos. The truth is that good signs guide us, they warn us, and they bring our attention to things that we might miss. They help us navigate roads and they help us direct us through buildings, physical spaces like buildings, and they help us to avoid unpleasant things. Now, stop sign, that's a little bit of an endangered species here in Hamilton County since we are all going to roundabouts, but in case you're not familiar, that is a stop sign. Though somebody was telling me that there's a place in downtown Fishers where there is a stop sign at the roundabout, which that I do not get, but good signs can be incredibly helpful, but sometimes signs can be a little bit confusing, like this one. Or they can be really confusing. I can't imagine going into that intersection. Or sometimes signs can give us mixed messages. or confusing in their redundancy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what that's all about. Uh, or pointless. <laughs> Sometimes the reality itself is confusing. This one I had to think about a little bit. I think this is a real sign. You th you'll have to think about that one for a while are just not well placed. Now this is one that you'd have to think about a little bit, but we'll zoom in on the sign because it's hard, it's bathroom sink. Um, I think I'll wait to refill my water bottle until a little bit later. Or if you show up at the store, I think I'll wait till later to show up. Or sometimes signs can just be confusing unless you're a quantum physicist. So all the physicists in the room, you can explain this one to me later. And I want to say thanks to Jerry Telford for doing the research with the sign. We know these are all legit. And two more signs uh, just for Josh Weber, who has a love of church signs. <laughs> Thought this, that one was good. Good signs are helpful because they help bring awareness to us. They bring truth to the surface. Confusing signs, not so much. And today we're going to look at how our lives are supposed to be good signs. You see, our lives are intended to point people to the hope that's found in Jesus. And to think about that, we're looking at the book of 1 Peter. And uh, just kind of a quick review of what this series is all about. Uh, 1 Peter is actually a letter in the New Testament, and it was written to a group of uh, mostly non-Jewish believers. They were likely younger in their faith, and they were living in the area that's now the country, that's currently the country of Turkey. And it's a letter that would have been circulated uh, among a number of churches. And this group of people were experiencing some misunderstanding from their neighbors and their friends. They were experiencing some criticism, and they were, in a lot of ways, probably considered social outcasts. And the writer that many people think was the disciple, Jesus' disciple, Peter, wants them to know that God hasn't forgotten them, that they're not alone in their difficulty, uh, that their difficulties, what they're experiencing matters. And one of the big themes of this book is he wants to remind them why it's such a big deal that they live good lives. And so last week we looked at the why, and our why starts with hope. And, and we looked at uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 13, and the second part reminds us to put all our hope, put all of our hope in the grace of salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. And this first part, preparing our minds for action and exercising self-control, is kind of like an athlete that's getting ready to to compete or to, to get ready to exercise, it defines how we put our hope uh, in Jesus. It's uh, that preparation. And so the writer, which is probably Peter, is calling them to be all in with how they live their lives. 
Now, next week, we're going to look at how living our lives matters because in the way it helps one another. It helps one another uh, as we are live together as a church community and as the broader church, not just around the, the church around Fishers, but even the church around the world. As we face challenges, we can encourage one another how we live our lives. But one of the encouragements that I gave to people last week was to actually take the time and read the book sometime, read through it during these first three weeks. Because one of the things that I think you'll see as you read this book, this book probably more so than a lot of the books of scripture that I read, I would say feels a little bit like a tapestry. And um, probably most of you know what a tapestry is, but it's kind of a woven uh, a woven image and you see the threads kind of you'll see them kind of pop out and then maybe you don't see them for a while and they pop out again and this book feels like a tapestry because there's many themes that are kind of interwoven and that kind of keep popping out at different parts in the book so as you read through it here's some of the themes that you'll see you'll see that that peter talks about that we have hope in jesus and that we're people of hope and that we have a new identity and as people of hope like we said we point people to the hope that we found in jesus by the way that we live our lives and sometimes when we do that people may misunderstand that and we may even suffer but the book reminds us that our suffering won't last forever and that god will redeem it and so i'm encouraging you to read the book for your the, the this letter for yourself and we're going to actually do that this morning so grab a bible or um, grab the Grace Fishers app or your favorite Bible app. And if you've got one of our Bibles in the seat in front of you or uh, underneath your seat, it's on page 1024. And I want to say welcome to our folks who are online or if you're on fall break, I hope you're having a great time if you're watching this uh, in a remote place or watching this later. So again, this week we're going to look at another reason that we live good lives because other people need hope and our lives can point to that hope. And so I'm going to start this week in chapter 2 in the last verse that we read. And so 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 11, uh, he says this, he says, Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Now, this phrase, temporary residents and foreigners, um, there's kind of this idea that we were, that we're, our primary citizenship is in another place, uh, in another country, that, um, that we're citizens of heaven, but it's not the only idea here. Temporary residents and foreigners, particularly in this culture, but I would say it's true in our culture, tend to be vulnerable. Citizens had rights and protection, but many of those rights and protections weren't extended to people that would have been immigrants, that would have been temporary residents and foreigners. They're weaker, they're more vulnerable, and they're in danger. And that's where oftentimes in the scriptures we're commanded to care for them. And I think Peter wants to remind them uh, as followers of, of Jesus that they live in somewhat in a vulnerable way as foreigners in a land that's not really their home. And this idea of waging war, it's a variation of the word for soldier or army. And so again, it's kind of reinforcement of this idea that they're living in hostile territory. And people that would have had a Jewish background because the Jews lived in a land that was occupied by the Roman soldiers, that anybody that had a Jewish background would have known immediately what Peter was talking about. Now this word soul, it's not, it shouldn't be understood as some sort of abstract part of ourself or it's not talking about uh, our life after death. Soul means your very life, your very self. And so Peter's first command here is, is to remember to live good lives because when we do wrong, um, it actually chips away at our identity and it chips away uh, at who we are and how we see ourselves. So. Peter starts there, but then he continues and he says, um, he says this, he says, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. world. Now this word that's translated as honorable is the Greek word kalos. And it's a rich word that means good and beautiful, both inward and outward beauty. It means beauty that's complete in balance or proportion. 
And when we live good lives, our lives can be beautiful. And this word expresses that. And it's a reminder that when we act in a day-to-day way, um, it can be beautiful that there, that to those that are outside the church. And it's the big why behind Peter's directive to keep our action and our lives beautiful. Now, Uh, In the NIV translation, it's slightly different, um, and I like this translation as well, when he says, live such good lives among the pagans, those are people who don't know Jesus, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. We live good lives because we have hope and because it's a way to give other people hope. And Peter challenges us to keep our interaction with unbelievers, people who don't know Jesus, honorable and good and beautiful, so that when God arrives, that they'll glorify him by seeing him earlier. Now, Peter doesn't fully explain how or why this works, but the picture is that somehow, uh, when they see our good deeds, even though we may be accused or misunderstood or even hated now, somehow, When God arrives, unbelievers will give him glory. Our good deeds are somehow play a part in opening their eyes to the glory of God. And so there's this future aspect to this idea, but there's also a present aspect because a little, a few verses later, Peter says this, he says, it's God's will that your honorable lives should silence those who, those ignorant people who make foolish uh, accusations against you. Now, it's generally not kind to call people ignorant, but what he means by this is people who just don't understand. And so what he's saying is simply, there are people who are gonna look at our lives that may uh, misunderstand why we do what we do, um, but we're reminded to live our lives, as our guest speaker a couple of weeks ago said, we're all in. we're all in because we or we should be all in because we're all pointing our lives to something we're all discipling um, we're all pointing our lives to something the way we live matters because uh, we point people to hope and while peter wants us to be clear that people may not always understand us now sometimes they will and even if they don't that we can trust god will redeem it for good in the end Our lives are intended to point people to the hope that's found in Jesus. So let me ask you this, what kind of sign are you? If somebody looked at your life, what would they see? Again, Peter challenges us to be a good sign. Now, it may raise the question, what does a good or honorable or beautiful life look like? Now, Peter lays this out for them actually in the second part of chapter two and through about half of chapter three in what's called a household code. These were ancient codes that described how people should manage their relationships from the government on down. And you have to remember, this is a very top-down, male-dominated world, much more so than we live in today. And part of what these Christians were being accused of in their world was that they were somehow subverting the public order uh, and that they were opposed to what were called traditional family values. And many of the directions that Paul or that Peter is outlaying in these family codes are actually reflections of cultural norms of the today. Now, I think when, often when we think about good, living good lives, we tend to think in moral terms, is it okay to do this thing or I wanna do the right thing and right or wrong? And I think those are important questions, but if you read through these household codes, what you see is that there's an emphasis instead on how we treat one another. And the word that Peter uses that I think the tone carries through, it's used several times, but it carries through the entire household codes is a word respect. And he uses this particularly as we respect those that are in authority over us. I had the privilege this week to uh, visit and hang out with the, the Wednesday morning men's group and they were doing an Andy Stanley study. And that was the point that Andy was making in his study this week, is that one of the most important things that we do is, yes, we need to live good lives, but the, the best way that we can do that is the way that we treat others with respect 
and with love. And Jesus simplified all the law and all the commandments that the Jews were given. And he said, love God and love your neighbor. Now, Peter highlights a number of categories. I'm going to touch on some of these categories briefly, but I'm not going to get into all the details. He starts by reminding people to respect those in authority in the government. Now, they had a very different system of government that we had. They had kings and appointed officials. They didn't have elections. But he reminds them to respect those in authority. And I think this is important for us. Um, there's been, honestly, a lot of res- loss of respect. And even, I think sometimes we're tested when the people that get elected are not people that we would choose. And so I think this is great to keep in mind as we're heading into election. Now, he also deals with a topic that, that is not so current in our world, though there's, there's slavery in, in many parts of the world and even probably some hidden ways that it exists in our country. But he d- addresses the whole issue and idea of slaves. Now, I just want to acknowledge that sometimes these passages have been used both historically and currently to justify oppression, and I'm not going to dive into all of the details, but if you're using the Grace Fishers app, there were some notes that I thought were interesting around this whole topic to give us kind of some background and put some of this in context, and so those notes are in the Grace Fishers app. But I think it's worth pointing out that Peter wasn't justifying the unjust treatment. He acknowledges it. Um, he's talking to, he's just talking and giving them instructions on how to react in a reality in a world that many of the people who were followers of Jesus, a number of them would have been slaves. And we have to keep in mind the whole of scripture around this topic. Um, you know, Paul's instructions in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 reminded slaves that if they had the opportunity to be free, that they could take it. We also have to keep in mind that this letter was not written from uh, somebody that was a master to his slaves, but this was written between people who were lower class people. They were equals, uh, and they're trying to figure out how do we live in a world that's broken? Um, How do we live with respect? And they're trying to figure this out together. And then it also deals with the topic of husbands and wives. And again, some of these commands sound a bit archaic to us, But you have to remember that husbands ruled with absolute authority. And the reality in their culture, because women were um, uh, oppressed um, and women didn't have power, is that in many cases, in many churches, women actually became believers before their husbands did because husbands had a lot more to lose if they converted to Christianity. And Christianity was appealing because it gave them dignity and worth. In particular, in chapter 3, verse 7, and I'm not going to read this, this is probably one of the most countercultural commands in the passage because Peter's command for husbands to treat their wives as equal before God would have been very unusual in the ancient world. And then Peter ends this passage with commands towards um, how we treat one another as believers. And those commands are pretty simple. He says, be of one mind, sympathize with one another, and love each other as brothers and sisters. He's reminding them, he's reminding us that we're a spiritual family that needs to be united. We need to help one another, and we'll dive into that idea more next week. Now, this idea of identifying a people and using them as a sign to point people to Jesus wasn't a new idea. It wasn't like this started with the church. In fact, if you go back into the book of Genesis, you see this idea very early on. After the world became a sinful place, um, God picked a man named Adam in Genesis 12. And he said, I'm going to make you into a great nation and you're going to bless the world or your family is going to bless the world and they're going to point people to me. And he said, you're going to be a light to the nations. And it's God's, it's been God's heart throughout the scriptures. And even as I was reading this week, uh, it's my habit currently to read through the Psalms. I came across Psalm 87, where again, we see God's heart for people who might be considered far away from him. And it's talked about people from Egypt and Babylon or Philistia or Tyre, uh, even distant Ethiopia, 
that they'll all become citizens of Jerusalem. You see, it's God's hope that people who are far from him are going to see the people that, call, that he calls as his own and that they'll understand who he is. And so there's this idea that they'll all become citizens of heaven. Now, obviously, Jesus was the ultimate sign um, because the Israelites failed to do this well. But then God gave us the task to represent him into this world and to point people to him. And I know that can be a lot of pressure, but that's why I think Peter or Paul reminds us in his letter to the Corinthians, he says this, he said, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars representing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is, not, is from God and not from ourselves. The Apostle Paul reminds us that when we point people to Jesus, we're not doing it on our power, we're not doing it on our ability. So there's three questions that I want us to kind of walk away and start to think about. Questions both for us as individuals and for us as a congregation. And the first question is, what does the sign of Grace Fisher say when people look at us? Now, obviously, I'm not talking about the physical sign when they see out front. But when they see this building, when they see us as his people, what do you think they think about us? Now, this is part of why we do things like the mobile pantry that, that Joey and Stephanie were talking about. It's why we open our building for events like the, the HSC High School Reverse Job Fair, which was an opportunity for special needs students to interview with employers. It's why we do things like partner with Hands of Hope to come alongside and support uh, foster families in our community and in our congregation. There's things that we do collectively because they're good, but also because we hope that as people see us doing these things, they'll understand that we point, we're pointing people to Jesus. But it's not just about the things that we do collectively. As we live beautiful lives at work or in school or in our neighborhood or wherever we live them out, there's a collective witness. And so the lives that we live individually become a collective that point people to Jesus. And that leads us to the second question, what kind of sign do people see when they look at your life? Is there anything in your life that's out of alignment with the hope that you profess? Do people feel respected by you, particularly people that you disagree with, whether it's on a, uh, a moral issue or a theological issue or somebody that just rubs you the wrong way? Do people in your life feel respected by you, even if you disagree with them? And then the last question is, what kind of sign do you want them to see? Because the truth is, and the reality is, that we're all a work in progress. None of us is going to be a perfect sign. And part of how we respect people and show the respect is when we make mistakes, that we're transparent, and we acknowledge those mistakes when we say that we're sorry. You know, when we started this message, or when I started this message, I asked the question, what would happen if all the signs disappeared from our world? And let me ask you a similar question. What if your sign wasn't displayed in this world? What would people uniquely miss out? What would they uniquely miss if they didn't see your sign pointing to the hope that's found in Jesus? And as I spent some time this week, I thought, what, I wonder what my life looks like, or what do I hope my life looks like? And this is the sign that I hope that people would see if they got to know me or if they saw my life. And when our uh, Beth Montgomery designed the sign, and my hope would be that they would see courage ahead, but with an arrow pointing up. Sometimes I struggle with anxiety or fear, particularly moving into the unknown. I can overthink things. My hope is that if somebody encounters me, they would understand that if I can do it, anybody can do it, or at least anybody who finds hope and help from above. 
So for you, what would your unique sign look like? What do you think your life is pointing to as people encounter you? And again, it's gonna look a little different for each one of us because our stories are, un are unique, our lives are unique, and the way that we point people to the hope that we have is gonna be different for each one of us. Friends, my encouragement is simple. Let's continue to point people to the hope that we have in Jesus. Let me pray for us. Father God, we just thank you for the reminder uh, both last week and this week as we've read uh, this book, uh, this letter that, that Peter uh, wrote to these churches. Uh, we're thankful for the hope that we have for ourselves and for the people that we encounter in our lives. And my prayer is simply this, that more and more and more that we would continue to point people to you, that they would somehow see in us uh, the hope that can be found in Jesus. And I pray that that would be true whether we're uh, uh, a student, whether we're an adult, whether we're young or we're old or somewhere in between. I pray that this church and this congregation would continue to point people to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.